All right, thanks, Craig. Yeah, and thank you all for coming. Um, I know coming to the post afternoon break session is hard, but this is a lot better than having the right before beers session. So I appreciate you uh, for being here and for my timing. Um, so as Craig mentioned, um, I'm gonna give uh, just kind of a general overview of um, NOAA Glorel's role in invasive species management um, in the Great Lakes through through the years. So talk of my the talk the title of my title is NOAA's role in supporting initiatives to manage invasive species in the Great Lakes and beyond. And if you are hoping for data and graphs and all of that, that's not happening. This is more of a, a story and conversation. So just if you want to leave, just be quiet as you walk out. Um, so here we go. So this is just kind of a, a general over, overview of what we're going to talk about. So I'll start with some of our, our past uh, initiatives. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on right now. And then how NOAA's role, how NOAA Glural's role in invasive species management has expanded outside of the Great Lakes. All right. So really the driver for NOAA getting involved with invasive species management generally, um, and, and Dave Reed mentioned this a little bit early today, was born out of the uh, Non-Indigenous Aquatic Nuisance Species Prevention and Control Act in 1990. And so this was really the first time in the nation that there was a collective idea that invasive species were a national issue. Um, going into this, uh, different entities kind of attacked invasive species on a piecemeal basis. But this was the first time where Congress and others came together and decided invasive species are something that needed to be addressed at a, at a national scale. And born out of this act was the creation of the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but NOAA plays a prominent role in. Um, and this task force brought together state and federal agencies to really address aquatic nuisance species around the country. Uh, looking specifically at the Great Lakes, under the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force are six regional panels. The very first regional panel that was established was the Great Lakes Regional Panel. And so this regional panel looked at engaging the state management agencies, NGOs, others to address specifically invasive species in the Great Lakes. And NOAA played a prominent part in that then, and it plays a prominent part in it now. Um, moving forward a little bit, the next piece of, um, it's not legislation, it was execu an executive order. It was executive order 13112 uh, established the um, National Invasive Species Council. And so this was a White House level group. So uh, eventually this became uh, a very pressing issue and in invasive species became a pressing issue in the, in, uh, to a presidential level. And they wanted executive um, information. So this was a White House group that provided policy and guidance at the highest level of federal government on invasive species. And again, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but NOAA plays a prominent role um, on that group. Um, focusing specifically on the Great Lakes, um, in 2004, there was Executive Order 13340, and this was the Great Lakes Regional Collaboration. And this is different from the uh, Great Lakes Collaboration Network that NOAA hosts and some of you are members of. This was bringing together cities and states and um, you know every, every sort of local government you could imagine uh, to really focus on the Great Lakes specifically and the threat of invasive species that they pose. Um, and then of course, there was the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in 2010, which gave a lot of money to the Great Lakes to do a lot of different things, um, but specifically for invasive species, it stood up a lot of programs that exist today. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those. So going specifically to um, NOAA, um, so NOAA uh, established an invasive species program at Glural in 2003. Um, OAR, so Oceanic Atmospheric Research, which is the line office within NOAA that Glural falls under, um, was the main managing line office to begin with, uh, but later the program was tra uh, transitioned to um, NOAA Fisheries, which is a different line office. Um, and, but this program was really instr instrumental in bringing in different partners within NOAA together. Um, so NOAA sanctuaries had been doing some piecemeal work on invasive species within the Great Lakes. Uh, but once this, once this program was established, it brought in all the entities within the Great Lakes um, of NOAA to, to focus on invasive species. Um, so the next part, Dave Reed, which I wish he was here, he really emphasized that I, I bring this up. Um, so a funding analysis was done at the onset of the program, and it was found that the program would need roughly $30 million a year to achieve its desired goals. 
it was given two and a half million dollars. Um, and so uh, this is a trend in NOAA and invasive species, which I won't go into, but I laughed at that. So I'm glad somebody, I heard a little chuckle out there. Um, so, so yeah, so uh, woefully under under uh, funded for what it was needed. Um, but eventually in 2009, the program was wiped from NOAA's appropriation. So it has not been funded since 2009. Um, however, there are a number of initiatives that were started during the tenure of this program um, that, that persist today. And we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, and so we've heard a little bit about some of these uh, already today, and I'll, I'll just kind of touch on their history. Um, but these are all these three are all ones that you could you could walk into Noah's lab today, and you would be you would recognize um, what they are. So the first is what we just heard from Ashley, um, looking at our history of zebra and quagga mussels. And as, as Dave mentioned, this this may have been the problem or the solution to to helping Noah stay in the Great Lakes, um, but you know, NOAA was instrumental in starting the research to actually look and map the abundance and distribution of zebra mussels within the Great Lakes. Um, this expanded to quagga mussels when they came in, um, really looking at the ecological effects, what, what their impacts are on food web dynamics and whatnot, and also looking at how they impact human health. Um, the next aspect that NOAA got involved in is plugging in with the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission and inserting invasive species into their food web dynamics. And so this was really the first time that, that people took a ecosystem approach to invasive species and how they impact energy flow, predator, play, predator prey dynamics. Um, what, what, what was their role in the food web? Um, I think we, 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 before this, we had looked at impacts on A versus B, and this was taking a more holistic approach to see how they really fit into the, the ecosystem dynamic. And again, this research persists through today, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little while. Maybe most notably, um, or, or you know, this gets a lot of publicity, or it did in the day, is the work with ballast water. Um, so, so Gloral was at the forefront of ballast water management and research, really to to address ballast water as a vector uh, of invasive species into the Great Lakes. And so Gloral expanded its um, aquatic invasive species research with the, uh, the No Ballast on Board program in 2000. Um, and this was started by Dave Reed, and I wish he was here, but he left at lunch. Um, but yeah, he, he, he is really the expert on that. And that's his picture in the bottom middle um, in the white suit, digging through some filthy ballast water. Um, he really pioneered a lot of that work. Um, and really the significant outcome of that research was that in 2006, Canada changed its regulations governing ships entering the Great Lakes and it required ships to, to, uh, to flush all ballast water out of their tanks, um, even those that were deemed empty. So this was really different from what they, they had before. Uh, they had different regulations depending on how much ballast water they had inside of it, what their cargo load was, but this wiped the, clean, the, the, the slate clean and said any ship that has ballast needs to flush their tanks out before they come into the, the Great Lakes. Um, and then in 2008, the, the St. Lawrence Seaway, which, you know, the St. Lawrence connects the ocean to the Great Lakes, like they adopted this as well. So any ship essentially coming into the Great Lakes now had to flush their ballast tanks completely before they came into the Great Lakes. And I guess the end result of that is that uh, was documented in this recent study that, that, that found that there was a, a dramatic reduction in new uh, aquatic invasive species. We haven't had a new aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes in a number of years. And this piece, uh, this, this, this publication emphasizes the fact that this is one of the very few pieces of legislation in the world that can point to its effectiveness of mitigating uh, the introduction of invasive species into a large area. So this is, was really fundamental work that, that went on um, with this ballast water work. Um, also, we, we heard about this a little bit before, but uh, around 2005, Glancis, the Great Lakes Aquatic Nuisance, Aqu Aquatic Non-Indigenous Species Information System, uh, was established uh, with funding from the NOAA Invasive Species Program. And so, for those of you that aren't aware of this, uh, this system um, functions as the Great Lakes specific node of the U.S. Ge Geological Survey's Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database. So it's a national database. Um, and so, so this is it's currently funded by. GLRI funds, um, but it aims to help 
um, to develop regionally relevant tools to support aquatic invasive species, early detection, rapid response, management, and education. Um, and it's really evolved over the years. I'll talk about some of the um, initial, uh, the, the new products that it puts out, but this was, you know, it, this was born out of the, um, the, the, the old NOAA invasive species program. All right, so that's just a, that was just a brief history of uh, the past. And so we'll talk about some of our efforts moving forward. And so first, um, looking at these new invasive species models um, and predictions. So this is building off of those efforts, looking at initially how invasive species impact the, the food webs and what we've done since then. Um, and so now we've taken these models and we are, we're able to predict current and potential future invasive species effects on the Great Lakes food webs. And, the, and now we can factor in how they impact regional economies. Um, these models not only look at individual species effects, but they also look at how these invasives may interact with other anth anthropogenic factors such as climate, uh, eutrophication, and hypoxia. Um, there's a range of, there's a suite of these models. They, they range from less complex to highly complex. They can include things like bioenergetics, individual base models, food web models, and even full ecosystem models that inc can incorporate things like hydrodynamics, bio biogeochemistry, food webs, fisheries. Um, and so really they can, they can, they're good tools to let us decide, okay, here's a suite of invasive species that we're concerned about. Which one should we prioritize? How are they going to, how are, how is one going to impact this economy, this fishery, this area. So, you know, when you're a management agency that's looking to prioritize where you put your resources, this is a good tool to decide this is the species that we should focus our attention on. Um, we folk, a lot of these models so far focus on dry seed mussels, but they've been expanded to look at, at potential future invasives, such as the various invasive carps, golden mussels, killer shrimp, and, and also things like rough and, and other things that are um, threatening the Great Lakes. I really don't need to talk much about this because Ashley did a fantastic, fantastic job of uh, summarizing the work that we've had um, with Dreisenid bustles. Um, but this is also ongoing from, from the past. Um, just trying to think of what she didn't say. I think she said it all. Uh, you know, she mentioned the, the Invasive Muscle Collaborative, um, you know, this interagency group that's, that's looking to formulate plans to, you know, look at control of mussels around the Great Lakes. Um, one thing that I know she's involved in and others at GLURL are, are cooperating with the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee on projects to look at local scale environmental impacts of uh, muscle removals. And so, uh, you know, I've seen presentations where they've gone out to areas and put blanket tarps out and just wiped out muscles in a single area and then figured out what's the collateral damage of essentially doing that in a spot. Um, and so, as, and also, as Ashley mentioned, we're starting to look at using um, underwater vehicles to remove and destroy uh, muscles um, in, in, in different locations. So, oh, yeah, Ashley crushed that one. So, thank you. Um, looking at glances, um, you know, improvements from glances, you know, from what it was before to what it is now, it's really become like a one stop shop for folks in the Great Lakes to, to really understand what invasive species are of concern. Um, and so if you go to Glances' website, you'll find this slide here. And if you click on that blue box, it's going to give you a species list generator. And so this is like the watch list. So Glances has assessed thousands of species of critters that could potentially get into the Great Lakes. And they do very deep dives into the, you know, um, life history, geographies, everything about this introduction pathway is everything about specific critters. Um, and they look at ones that can, they have to meet certain thresholds to get on this watch list. And so of the thousands of, it, of individual organisms that I looked at, there's about 90-ish that are on this watch list. And these are ones that can possibly get to the Great Lakes, they can survive over winter, and they can reproduce in the Great Lakes. And so this is a, a fantastic tool that is like very, very regularly updated. And a lot of managers use this very regularly to, to make decisions on what species to prioritize when we're looking at Great Lakes manage or uh, invasive species management in the Great Lakes. Um, and so, yeah, Glances has, has, has come a long way. It's constantly evolving, and they do a really great job. And um, again, this is you know this was born out of the old um, no invasive species program, but now is GLRI funded, so hopefully it continues on to perpetuity. And so to wrap up. 
I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to expand out of the Great Lakes and just kind of show you how Glorel's footprint in invasive species has evolved over time past the Great Lakes. So hopefully you are, have some interest in that. Um, so I talked about this a little bit, but you know, there's two, there's two inter U S federal interagency groups. Um, one that is the national invasive species council. Um, so there are three co-chair co agencies, uh, department of commerce through NOAA, DOI and USDA. Um, NOAA is designated as one of the co-chair principals of that agency. Uh, Glorals director, director Debbie Lee serves as the senior advisor of that group and I, I help support her. Um, but again, this is like a White House level helping to make policy and guidance on invasive species across the nation, both Great Lakes and beyond. Um, and then there's the Aquatic Use and Species Task Force. Um, NOAA serves as the co-chair of that along with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Debbie serves as the chair of that group. Um, I serve as the prevention subcommittee chair. Um, and again, this is just taking, this also looks at the Great Lakes, but beyond. So looking at, you know, what can we do around, about invasive species and beyond. And so Debbie and I are very involved. Uh, so I guess in, by happenstance, Glural is very involved in looking at invasive species outside of the Great Lakes. And so some of the big initiatives that we're focused on are things like European green crab on the West Coast. And I will point this out because for the first time since 2009, when the uh, Oh, wait, when the invasive species program got defunct, we for the first, this year got congressional language in our NOAA's budget to do invasive species work. It's all on European green crab, it's all on the West Coast, but we, we got something. So the, we're moving the tip a little bit. Um, then we have things in the Caribbean, you know, the, the bioregical, you know, I don't need to go into these, but they're, these are pressing issues um, to, to, to relate to some of that. I, I was just uh, on a congressional call yesterday with staff from somebody from Hawaii that was focused on these invasive soft corals. So staff at Glural are doing a lot within the invasive species realm, both within the Great Lakes and beyond. Um, and so thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, here are the, the contributors to this presentation. So thank them very much. I tried to section them off and where they were at, um, but thank you for your time and I'll have you answer any questions. Thanks.